Hello and welcome to the course Computational Geotechnics using Optum G2 and G3. My name is Christian Krabenhaft. I am a professor at the University of Liverpool in the UK. Just a brief outline of the course. Uh, the course comprises six modules and this video here uh, covers the first module, Introduction to Optum G2. I would like to say, just remind you that you can download the program that we'll be using in the course um, from the web page, from the Optum web page, optumce.com. Both Optum G2 and Optum G3 can be downloaded from here. So I hope you'll do that as soon as possible uh, because we are going to really be using these programs quite extensively. And the sooner you get to play around with them, I think uh, the better. So. What is Optum G2? Well, it's a finite element program for geotechnical applications in 2D, so plane strain and axis symmetry. The G stands for geotech and the 2 stands for 2D. And I just wanted to say a few words about where um, Optum G2 fits into the landscape of geotechnical analysis software. And what I've done is I've drawn a diagram where on one axis, the Y axis here, I plot some measure of the ease of use, and on the other axis, the x-axis, uh, generality. So different programs would, would fit in differently in this diagram. And um, if we look at very specialized applications, for example, the program Wallop, which is used quite extensively, I think, for retaining wall analysis, Slide for slope stability analysis, well, these are very specialized programs. Um, and in many ways, because they are so specialized, they are also very easy to use. So they score high on the ease of use measure, but low on the, um, in terms of generality. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have more general purpose programs. Abacus, of course, a completely general finite element program, and also Plaxis, which is a general purpose program as well, but geared for geotechnical applications. Um, they uh, are general, but they are not particularly easy to use. So they would fit somewhere out here. And the idea with Optum G2 is actually to have a program that scores high on both axes. So in terms of generality, it's similar to Plaxis. There are certain things that Plaxis can do that Optum G2 can't do, and vice versa. And um, um, but in, but it's 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 fairly general, and in terms of ease of use, uh, it, it also really scores quite high. Uh, I think you won't be convinced of this before you actually start using the program. So um, we can return to this slide maybe at the end of the course and 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 discuss it in some more detail. That would be that would be interesting to see what you think. Uh, analysis capabilities. <coughs> Uh, limit analysis is one of the basic analysis types of Optum G2. It's, a, it's a quite a unique feature. I don't think it's available in any other commercial program. It's a very powerful technique for evaluating the bearing capacity or the limit load of structures without out having to actually perform a full load displacement analysis. So you can evaluate bearing capacities in one quick calculation. And not only that, you don't only get an approximate estimate of the bearing capacity, but you get rigorous upper and lower bounds, uh, which really adds a lot of confidence to your results. This is the topic of uh, Module 2, Limit Analysis, so we'll be looking at it in a lot more detail than Strength Reduction. That's the topic of Module 3. Um, it's, in a certain sense, uh, the complementary analysis type to Limit Analysis. We are not looking for limit loads. We're not looking for the maximum load that a structure can sustain, but we are looking for the minimum material parameters um, that a structure needs to have in order not to be at failure. And <clears throat> so these parameters are found and they are then compared to the actual parameters and in that way a uh, factor of safety can be computed. So it's factor of safety analysis. Elastoplastic analysis, so that's for deformation analysis, uh, for example excavations or or just the settlement of a footing, whatever. Consolidation analysis, same kind of thing, but with 
excess pore pressures and the dissipation of excess pore pressures involved. That will be relevant when it comes to embankment construction, which is also part of the course. Seepage analysis, well, sometimes we have seepage that can be accounted for as well. <coughs> Initial stress analysis, that's a, a unique analysis type in, in Optum G2. Um, we, in geotechnics, uh, we always have one load, namely, um, namely uh, that stemming from self-weight. That gives rise to some initial stresses in the ground and, and we need to account for them in a reasonable way and that's what this initial stress analysis is all about. We'll go through that in more detail as well when it comes to modules. Um, four and five. Stage construction, that's not really an analysis type in itself. It's just to say that, that the program really facilitates a very convenient and intuitive sequencing of construction stages, be it in connection with an excavation or an embankment construction or uh, uh, another type of problem where you would need to link different stages with each other with the geometry uh, changing from stage to stage. And then random field analysis, it's not part of the course, uh, but we might be able to discuss it during the, um, during the exercises, uh, if any of you are interested in it. Special features, and they're not that special, just to say that all the structural elements needed for the modeling of walls, anchors, geotextiles, and so forth are available. Shear joints for modeling of, of interfaces, cracks, joints, that kind of thing. Adaptive remeshing a very powerful uh, functionality uh, where the idea basically is to put the elements where you need them. So instead of just using a uniform mesh, get the program to actually adapt the mesh to capture the, the solution in the best possible way. So this is something that at the end of the day maximizes accuracy while at the same time minimizes um, uh, computational time. Materials library, there's a comprehensive set of materials available in the program. I'll go through them in the next slide. And then design approaches for those of you who are based in Europe um, and follow Eurocode 7. There is some inbuilt functionality for, for, very, uh, for, for, for sort of convenient application of partial factors according to Eurocode 7, um, according to one of the three design approaches, one, two, and three depending on where exactly you are in Europe. So soil and rock models, uh, all the, all the basic materials, uh, more Coulomb, Drogoparaka, Tresca are available, and um, also more complex uh, materials, Hook Brown for the modeling of fractured rock masses, modified cam clay. Um, it is actually a, an extended version of this model for soft soils. And another extended model, the extended more Coulomb model, it's very similar to the so-called hardening soil model. So that's for more hardening soil, say for sands or, or, or similar materials. Bolton as well, it's a non-linear more Coulomb envelope for sands. And GSK, similar, I prefer this actually over Bolton, but we'll return to that in, in one of the modules as well. And various other materials. I, it's not the complete list here. But just to say that, uh, a good range of materials from the simple, from the more basic to the more complex are available. So typical applications, well, that's some of the applications we'll be considering in this course, slope stability foundations, retaining systems, excavations, embankment construction, and so forth. Everything basically that you can think of within a 2D plane strain or axisymmetric framework can be handled. Then of course, there's a graphical user interface I will go to that in a minute, um, just to say that it is, um, I think quite a lot of thought has gone into that and um, it's one of the things that really facilitates user friendliness. It's not everything. The computational core, or the capabilities of the computational core are another part of it, but the user friendliness is definitely a, a, an important part of it as well. It is something that facilitates an intuitive workflow, for example, um, in connection with, with something like excavations. So um, again, this is something you, you, will, you will discover yourselves. Now, <coughs> this course doesn't cover 
finite element theory as such, shape functions and all, all that kind of basic finite element theory. I'm assuming that everyone has some sort of idea of what finite elements are. Um, so, so I will not cover that in detail, but just to, to give you a very brief introduction to how conventional finite element analysis works, and then we'll look at how, uh, how Optum G2 differs from that by actually using the program. So a, a basic test problem, um, probably more than anything else, uh, could also be a real problem, but a strip footing on a some sort of soil here. Um, so we have some load applied to the footing and there are some supports around the edges of the of the soil domain and the soil has some uh, it's it's, it's the stress strain response is described by some sort of model for example more coulomb with some uh, parameters uh, as well the cohesion friction angle young's modulus and so on and um, this um, problem is then described mathematically by a set of really quite uh, involved nonlinear partial differential equations, things like equilibrium equations, stress-strain relations, the yield condition, and so on and so forth. It's a very complex set of nonlinear equations that can almost never be solved analytically. So what is done with the finite element method is to approximate these equations over over finite elements, over regions of a, a finite size. It could be, as shown here, triangular elements, but it could be, in principle, elements of any shape. So approximate the original governing equations over each of the finite elements, and then solve the approximate equations, whereby, of course, you get an approximate solution. And the finite element method is then set up so that the more elements you use, the closer you get to the true solution. So, um, so typically in finite element analysis, conventional finite element analysis, and that, that's exactly the same in, in Optum G2, you would uh, construct the finite element mesh and then um, derive these approximate equations, discrete equations, that you are then going to solve. And um, looking at this problem here, what would almost be second nature to a conventional finite element analyst would be to take this load here and basically increment it from from zero and until the displacements settlements become sufficiently large for you to sort of say okay I'm at failure so basically generate the load displacement curve right so we have the load and we have the versus the displacement. And this QU up here, uh, the ultimate limit load, um, is something that uh, almost always needs to be computed. Whether the design is actually based on this or not, uh, it needs to be uh, computed. So the full load displacement curve, of course, gives you all the information you need. It gives you the settlement or the displacements at, at lower stress levels and it gives you the ultimate limit load as well. Except that um, in many programs you would get, you'd be able to trace part of the curve but then at some stage it might be here, it might be already down here, wherever, the program would start complaining. It might say that the soil has failed whereas you have probably more of a suspicion that it's the program that has failed but you don't know. And then if you continue beyond this point, you might get something like this. And you might start interpreting that as, as in terms of real physics, even though in far most cases it's actually a numerical artifact. It's not soil behavior. This is actually program, a deficient program behavior. So um, you have your load displacement curve and then um, looking something like this. And then the question is, um, what is your limit load actually? How do you read off your limit load? Do you, do you take the first point here where the program first started complaining? Do you take the maximum value? That would probably not be a fantastic idea. 
the minimum value that's kind of maybe dubious as well and so how about being democratic and taking some average you could sort of argue that that might be an idea um, but the basic problem is you don't know and even if you do generate a nice smooth curve you're still left with the question of what is actually the accuracy how good is this solution if I get 275 kPa how good how close is that number to reality there's no way of assessing that you have to then go back to the original problem uh, refine the mesh for example double the number of elements solve again double and uh, keep doubling the number of elements until the um, the limit load uh, from one doubling to the next um, sort of remains the same so so, so uh, and 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 then you have to deal with this of course as well so so it's a bit of a problem and uh, Optum G2 has a solution to that um, another problem which is not so much of a, of a problem as such not so much of a technical problem but um, considering all the difficulties with generating these load displacement curves uh, you might go back and ask yourself what is it really we want and in my opinion what we want is two things we want the ultimate limit load so we want to say something about the ULS the ultimate limit state that's what we read our, of uh, up here and then in addition to that we need to know something about the SLS the serviceability limit state so that is the deformations under the working loads for example if this is the working loads here then we need to know what are the deformations corresponding to that load those are the two key pieces of information we need we don't really need the full load, load displacement curve it might be nice to have but it's not strictly speaking really necessary and this is um, one example of which Optum is is capable of what is sometimes uh, advertised as um, the ability to compute to deliver direct answers to direct questions so in this case there's two questions what is the ultimate limit load and what are the deformations under the working loads those, those are the two key questions that can then be dealt with in a direct manner that is to say without generating this full load displacement curve the load displacement curve can be generated as well but it's not really necessary so um, so that was a, a, a brief introduction and I will now then start up Optum G2 and just basically introduce the uh, various features uh, of the program so when you start it up you are um, you get this you get this welcome window where you have some recent files some recent projects and then the manuals are available here there's a really quite a comprehensive set of manuals theory uh, materials uh, describing all the, the material models available in the uh, program and um, so more coulomb for example and and so on um, Drucker Parga so all, all, all the materials are described in that manual and then there is another really useful manual is the examples manual which contains something like I think 70, 70 examples yeah uh, from the simple to, to the more complex so that's a really useful resource there is a um, there are some videos here as well I think they're a bit out of date to be perfectly honest I would advise you to go to the Optum CE YouTube channel and, and check out the latest videos and then um, for all the examples that are described in the examples manual these 70 examples the corresponding input files are available over here so for example um, whatever reinforced soil retaining wall is this problem 64 and um, that is then described in the manual the problem is presented and there's some commentary to it and if you rerun the problem so that's the problem here 
if you rerun the problem in in uh, Optum G2, you should get <coughs> you should get the same results as are stated in the manual. So that's how that works. And um, so let's let's start up a new project and just a just a brief introduction to the user interface. So the way it works is that there's four ribbons geometry, which contains various tools for defining and manipulating geometry. Then there's the materials ribbon, which contains all the, the material models. Uh, there is the features ribbon, which contains things like supports, loads, uh, structural elements, anchors, and so on. Flow boundary conditions as well for, for seepage analysis. And then the results ribbon, which will be populated once the results are in. But if we go back to, to the materials ribbon, um, so yeah, this, this contains all the necessary tools for defining and manipulating geometry. And if we were to set up this problem that I showed you here, or something that, that looks like it anyway, um, the way we would do that is by, we could use this rectangle tool here. So I would um, then draw a rectangle say something like that and uh, so that would be my soil domain and then I would I would define a footing uh, let's see where I am out here uh, I'll define a footing let's give it some embedment and then um, this is the footing we can we can delete this line here note that there's automatic intersection of uh, automatic uh, recognition of intersections so that's pretty convenient. Say if you have a, say if you have a, um, a subdivision like that. Uh, but let's let's just make it homogeneous for this for the time being. You are now saying, what if I want to change the the geometry, uh, the coordinates to to this point up here? Well, information about anything you see on the screen, you get access to that by just simply selecting it. So information about this this point here, well, that's the coordinates, and they're available over here then in the property uh, window, and they can be modified as you like as well. So for example, like that. Um, we don't want to do that, so I will undo. So that's the basic premise of the user interface. Information about anything you see on the screen, you click it to obtain, and um, if possible, also to edit the information. Not everything can, can be edited, of course, but um, something like a coordinate, of course, can. So that's, that's the geometry up and running. And then we move on to, on to materials. And um, again, information, what, is, what are these materials all about? Well, you click it and, and then find out. So we have this more Coulomb material here. For example, uh, it contains all kinds of parameters, um, as shown here. Uh, Droga Praga, the same, uh, Tresca, and so forth. And for this material, we for this problem, we might say, okay, this is an this is an a clay. It's undrained. We want to do an undrained analysis, so we would use uh, Tresca. So I need to apply Tresca, the Tresca material model, to this domain here. And I can do that in two ways. I can either um, drag this icon from the ribbon and then simply apply it, or I can do as I'm going to do for the footing, where I'm going to use this rigid material. I can select and then assign. So the rigid material is, is a perfectly rigid material with um, the only material parameter really being the unit weight. So it has infinite strength and it has infinite stiffness. So that is, is quite convenient for modeling things like foundations and, uh, and uh, gravity retaining walls and things like that. We can, we can, we can, give, it a, um, we can give it a unit weight. Let's say it's reinforced concrete. So then it would be something like 24 kilonewton um, per uh, meter cubed. And then uh, let's just have a look at the Tresca model. So it has a stiffness 
30 MPA, it has strength. These are default parameters, they can be changed. So we could say, let's say that the strength is a little more, it's 50. It's still pretty soft. Um, and the unit weight, we distinguish between the dry and the saturated unit weight. We can actually do that in this example here as well. Let's put in a water table. So I go to the features menu and then I select the water table tool and then I can put my water table down here two meters below the ground surface. And um, as I was saying with the unit weights, so there's a dry unit weight, so that unit weight would be used above the water table and there's a saturated unit weight which is a bit bigger in this case which is going to be used below the groundwater table. And um, and that's that's how that is. Now, loads, we, if we were sort of to reproduce the example from, from the slides, I would need to apply some load up here. And um, there are two types of loads available in the program. There are the ones shown in green here and the ones shown in red. The green are so-called fixed loads. Uh, so these are loads that remain at their fixed values throughout any calculation that you might want to do. Whereas the multiplier loads are loads that in one way or another are incremented. Um, so in this case, where we want really to have the loads, uh, say we want to have the load displacement curve or, or the um, uh, want to generate, want to have the ultimate limit load, um, then we need a multiplier load on top here of the footing. And um, then we need to support the soil domain, of course, as well. And that is done via these tools here the, in the support section of, of, of the features ribbon. Or we can just press the button standard fixities. Um, and then uh, the uh, normal fixities are applied here on the sides and the bottom of the domain is fully fixed. So now we are actually all set up and the question is then how to generate results. And let's say we want to determine the limit load first, the ultimate limit load or the bearing capacity or whatever you like to call it. Um, we then move over to the stage manager here. There is the name of the stage, there's something, a column here called from, that's to do with, with linked stages, we won't need that in this example. And then there is a, a column called analysis where you would sec select the appropriate analysis according to what you want to do. And in this case, we actually want to do a limit analysis because we want to determine the ultimate limit load of this foundation. So select limit analysis, which is as well the default analysis type. And then there are some settings associated. So say if I, if I did C-pitch, there would be some settings. Uh, but it's limit analysis that I'm going to do. Then there are some settings associated with this stage, which depend on the analysis uh, type. Um, and uh, the ones that are relevant here are, uh, these first two here, I'll go through them later on, but the ones that are relevant for the time being is the element type. You click that and there are various elements available. There is an element called lower, which actually uh, implies that the results will be lower bound, so they will be below the exact solution uh, and upper is the same. Using this element type you will get a limit load that is guaranteed to be above the exact solution. Then there are the, the conventional 6 and 15 node elements available as well and, and various other elements if, if you press this one others. But let's just stick with lower and let's say uh, let's use a thousand of those elements. So now we are computing a lower bound on the limit load on the bearing capacity. So that's good, but we would also like an upper bound. And um, if I, uh, I can either run this or and then switch to upper or I can clone this stage, so that's this button here, press that, then I clone the stage, basically create a copy of it, and then in the second stage here I can switch to upper. So. I will call the first stage here LB, oh, LB and lower bound and 
the second one here, I'll call it UB, upper bound. And then I'm pretty much ready to run. Uh, and that is done by just pressing the play button here. And this window pops up with, with some information, uh, including the collapse multiplier. So what is the collapse multiplier? Well, that is the number that I should multiply onto this load, which had a, a reference value, which had a value of 1, in order to be at collapse. So the limit load um, is QU, is the lower bound is 292.784 times 1, and the upper bound is 393.5. So you see a bit of a gap between the lower and upper bounds. We know that the true solution is somewhere in between. It's somewhere in between 292 and 393. So that would be something like, say, uh, what is it, 350 or so. And um, and um, or, or 3 340 um, we can we can actually compute that exact uh, number so I'm just going to start up MATLAB here to do some so the LB was 292 the UB 393. Now the exact solution is somewhere in between. Where exactly in between is it? Well, if it's right in between, then the exact solution would be equal to the average of the lower and upper bounds, right? So the average between the lower and upper bounds is actually very often a good estimate of uh, the exact solution. So I can say A for average, and I can say that's LB plus UB divided by 2. So that's 343. Um, and I can then uh, also compute an error. So the error is basically the average minus the lower bound divided by the average times 100, um, which is 14, which is the same as if I did it with UB, the, with the, except with a, with a sign change. So the error here, the worst case error, if I say this is my estimate of the exact solution, 343, um, then the worst case error that I'm committing is about 15%. So we could say the exact solution is 343 plus minus 15%. 15%, is that an acceptable level of error? Well, it's it's... It, it might be, um, and at least uh, if you know what the error is, then you can make that assessment. Uh, under normal circumstances, we would not know what that error is, of course. So, so it is, there is a bit of a gap between the upper and lower bounds, uh, but that is how it is. And if we close down the analysis window, we can then have a look at, at the results. So you see two things here that I just wanted to mention. And that is, uh, first of all, the mesh has been generated as part of the analysis. It doesn't require a separate stage, separate stage that you need to process manually in order to create the mesh. It's done automatically. You can take charge of, to some extent, of the meshing. You can specify uh, a finer mesh around certain points or along certain lines and so on. We'll go through that as well, but usually it's not necessary. Usually it's much better to just give the program full charge of creating the mesh. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is uh, that we have a water table here, of course, as well. And the way this, and this water table basically um, gives rise to, um, in this case, it doesn't actually give rise to a seepage, but because it's just a static water table. But as soon as any of these flow BCs are included in the problem, a seepage analysis will automatically be conducted as part of any mechanical analysis. So in this case, it was a limit analysis. The seepage analysis will be conducted as part of this limit analysis. The pore pressures will be determined. They're available here. And they will then be used um, in the standard effective stress framework when conducting 
the mechanical analysis. So all that's really required is to set up the problem um, and then press run. So focus on the, on, on, on the engineering, on the physics of the problem, and then let the program handle the rest. Um, we can, we can, let's switch back to the mesh, and there's this play button here, which then shows the, <coughs> excuse me, a movie of the deformations uh, at failure, in this case. Uh, so this is for the upper bound, and if we switch to lower bound, it looks something like this. These lower bound elements appear to, to somehow fracture. That's not how it really is. We are not dealing with discontinuous media here, but it's a peculiarity of the lower bound element that it gives rise to, to displacements that look like this. The upper bound is much more along the lines of what you are used to with conventional finite elements. But you can see the same type of pattern here, of course. And then we, can, we could plot the strains. Um, that looks something like this. So this is kind of not completely unexpected. Uh, we have a lot of straining here in the vicinity of the foundation, and the strains eventually define a, a collapse mechanism. And the same for the lower bound. It'll look a little bit different, but it's, it's going to because it's two different elements, but it'll be same kind of pattern. So something like that. Another quantity that is really quite relevant, I would like to introduce that already at this stage, is under this category plasticity, there is something called shear dissipation. So the shear dissipation uh, is the shear strains multiplied by the shear stresses at failure. So that's often a good measure for what actually goes on in terms of, in terms of failure within the soil. Uh, in this case, you, you have exactly the same picture, or very, a very similar picture to what you have if you just plot the strains. But the shear dissipation is, is a really good measure of now uh, where I would actually like to put my elements. So you can see I have a uniform mesh here, so I'm wasting a lot of elements out here. Uh, wouldn't it make sense to somehow use a coarser mesh out here and then use finer elements here. I think that would make a lot of sense, and that is exactly the idea behind mesh adapt adaptivity. So the way mesh adaptivity works is under the settings, uh, or um, in the stage manager here, there is a category called mesh, and you have mesh adaptivity. No is the default answer to that question, but you can switch it to yes. and then some more categories, op some more fields open up. And um, the first one here is the adaptive iterations. The second one is the start elements, called start elements, so the number of elements to start with. And then there's something called adaptivity control on exactly what basis are you adapting the mesh? Are you adapting on, on the basis of, of strain or stress or shear dissipation? And shear dissipation is the default setting and it is in 99.9% .9 of cases the uh, setting of choice. So the way this works is I start with a thousand elements then I compute a solution and that will be exactly the solution I've computed here. There's a thousand elements here more or less um, and I get the solution that would then be the first iteration. I get the solution and I come up with a better mesh so I make the mesh finer in here and coarser out here, compute again, that's the second iteration, mm -hmm. and then I repeat the whole thing for a third time in a third iteration. So three adaptive iterations, starting from a thousand elements, and in this case, moving up to a thousand elements as well. Um, so basically, in the course of three iterations, rearranging uh, this 1,000 elements. And, and let's see... Um, I'll do the same for the lower bound stage. And you can see then the, the flag, the stage flag here changes from, uh, it, it's gr a, green, a green tick means that valid results are available. So that is to say results corresponding to the actual input, input in terms of material parameters, input in terms of, 
of stage settings. As soon as I change anything, this green tick will change into an arrow, uh, like so, and an arrow means basically process this stage. If you untick this arrow, uh, then it will not be processed. So, but in this case, we want to run both stages. So let's do that again. And um, we now see the lower bound. It started at 292 or 293. And it has moved slightly up to 311. And the upper bound, well, that started at 393. And it moves down to 345. So the gap, the, upper, the lower bound has come up and the upper bound has come down, so the gap has been reduced. And again, we can have a look at what the error now is. So if we say LB uh, was now 3.11, UB is 3.45, what is the average? It's 3.28, and the error is Or let's say this is the worst case error. So now the you can say the solution actually the bearing capacity is 328.5 plus minus 5.3 percent. So a better estimate and a better a lower uh, worst case error. And let's look at how the mesh has then changed. Uh, it has changed slightly. You can see there is a, a finer mesh up here and a coarser mesh out here. And if you look at the deformations, you will see you will see a, a, a tendency to a rotation here. That's a kind of a peculiar thing. You see, this is a completely symmetric problem. Uh, so why don't we have a symmetric collapse mechanism? Well, that's because the mesh is slightly unsymmetric. And so you will have this tendency to rotation. This is something you see actually in, in, in real life full scale tests as well. But no matter how symmetric you make things, it has a tendency to rotate. And uh, so just a slight asymmetry in the mesh actually induces this rotation. So that's the, lower uh, the upper bound and the lower bound. Well, it is actually, um, it is actually it rotates a little less, but but that's that's somewhat of a of a uh, of a coincidence in this case. So um, and the mesh here has has been adapted as well. Now you will of course want to use possibly more elements. Let's do something like ten thousand. And then try to see what we get. Yeah, so lower bound, it was 311 before, now it's 324. And the upper bound, previously it was 345, and now it's down to 331. What is the average? The average is 328, which is exactly the same as we had before, plus minus something very small. So before, with 1,000 elements, we had 328.5. Now with 10,000 elements, we get an average of between the upper and lower bounds of 328.1. So almost the same, and this is something you see more often than not, that even for a very coarse mesh, the average of the upper and lower bounds is really a very good estimate of the eventual exact solution. So um, the worst case error now about 1.2%. So 
the exact solution is 328.1 plus minus 1.2 percent. And I think we are now um, at a level of error that would uh, definitely be accep acceptable. So we can say, let's just say between ourselves that the solution to this problem, uh, the bearing capacity is 328 kPa. And the mesh, you can see, has, has really been adapted now. Uh, let's try to plot the shear dissipation again. And let's just move this slider to get, and you have a nice, well-defined collapse mechanism. Same for the lower bound. Same, but slightly different. But it, it'll, be, it'll be very similar, something like this. <coughs> And one thing I, I, I regret that I forgot to mention, but it's kind of too late now uh, to, to go back, but I'll mention it now. Uh, the magnitude of the load up here um, of this multiplier load is, is 1 or, or minus 1. So you can see begin here. See a small b here. That is the beginning of, the, of this line. And then end uh, e. So it is minus 1 in the y direction at both ends of this line here. So the collapse multiplier is the number that should be multiplied onto this value of, of 1 or minus 1 in order to uh, have a state of collapse. If I had put 10 here, well then my collapse multiplier would have been 10 times less than what I actually got in these analysis. So. Um, <coughs> So that was the limit load. That was that was uh, the first part of 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 the question, of um, of what we really need. Uh, what is the failure load? We have determined that it's 328 kPa. Now then, the uh, deformations under the working loads. So if the failure load is 328, well then, what is the working load? It might be something like say uh, 250. And so it's definitely less than, than, than the ultimate limit load. And it might be something like 250. And it, uh, we would need to determine then the settlement under this load of 250 kPa. So what we're going to do here is uh, we can do it in two ways, but I'm just going to do it in, in one way here. I'm going to remove this load. And then I am going to put on a fixed distributed load of 250. I could also have changed as an option over here if you press the load. It's a multiplier load, so it's very easy to actually change a multiplier load to become a fixed load in that way. I didn't actually have to delete and then reapply, but just to show you the two different ways. and. Um, <coughs> Then we are not doing a limit analysis here. We are not determining any ultimate limit loads. We want to do an elastoplastic analysis. We want to determine what are the deformations, what are the plastic strains, and so on, under this load of 250 kPa. And that is done in a, in a direct calculation. I again have the same kind of settings here as in my limit analysis. I'm now going to use a six node, this six node, node Gauss element, which is a standard six node element, which is, it's, and it's a pretty good element. You can use the 15 node element as well, but in my experience, um, the six node element, especially if you use mesh adaptivity, really um, delivers the same kind of, or even better accuracy. So number of elements and then load steps, we'll just s keep that at one. And so apply everything at once, determine these settlements in one direct calculation. And again, we can use mesh adaptivity. Now, for this analysis, the, uh, the initial stresses are computed automatically. If you don't specify anything, if you don't specify a, strage, a stage where to take the initial uh, stresses from, the initial stresses will be calculated automatically in much the same way as the, the pore pressures are calculated automatically as part of the analysis. So we see here max displacement, something like 2.7 uh, 
centimeters and how does it look it looks something like this um, and you can see the adapted mesh here now looks rather different from the mesh in the limit analysis case so this mesh here has been adapted to capture basically the failure solution um, or the, the state at, at collapse this mesh has been adapted to this situation we have here where we are below collapse uh, so it's been basically adapted to capture both the elastic and the plastic characteristic uh, characteristics of the uh, of the problem in the best possible way and if you see, see the shear dissipation for example well it looks something like this so the plasticity uh, the failure in the soil is of course much less developed than in the full failure case right so that's how that works and we can plot the displacements as well let's plot uh, the vertical displacement so that looks something like that maybe you would want to change the colors around here you can invert and then um, basically show it like this you can see you have some deformations here at the boundaries you might want to to extend um, to extend the domain here further out I don't think it's going to make much of a difference but it's something you might want to uh, do so that's how it works uh, the limit load the ULS in one direct calculation and the SLS in another direct calculation now if we really wanted to generate the full load displacement curve there is an analysis type for that as well can be done in, in, in various ways. We could also have applied some displacement boundary conditions to, to this uh, uh, foundation here and then sort of incremented the displacements of the footing. So basically pushed the footing into the ground incrementally. Or what we can do is if I clone this stage as well and I am now going to press down Alt while I clone it and that will put this stage at the end of the list. Um, there is an analysis type called multiplier elastoplastic and that's in a certain sense a combination between limit analysis and elastoplastic analysis so limit analysis in the sense that we operate with limit with uh, multiplier loads multiplier loads that are gradually incremented up to collapse so up to the limit load but we trace the full load displacement curve so compute displacements as in an elastoplastic analysis along the way and uh, so if I press play here and you can then no let me just let me just show another thing so I can always stop and then I get sort of a yellow triangle meaning that um, there's something uh, fishy about this stage that I have in this case it's that I haven't actually finished the analysis uh, but I am going to use also what is known as a result point. So if I want to capture, to basically lock the results at a point, I can use this result point. I click that and then put this result point. It's result point one, as you can see here at the top of the foundation. We could try to put one at the other end. So if it rotates, there will be a difference between the load displacement curves for these two points here and then I'm ready to go multiply elastoplastic and I um, am ready to go details of this analysis type are covered in the manual but we can also cover it in in other parts of the course it's basically increment the load until failure or until somewhere close to failure in the course of, of a number of, of, of steps can see the number of steps I've used here is, is kind of a bit too low. I'll just go through that here. So um, it's down here under load stepping. So NE elastic steps 10, NP plastic steps 10. That's to be interpreted in the way that typical load displacement curves kind of comprise two characteristic parts, a more or less elastic branch here and then say something more elastoplastic or, or plastic and that's what what these two um, parameters here basically signify so 
So NE is approximately the number of steps spent on this initial more or less linear part of the curve and NP is the number of steps spent on the, uh, the rest of the curve. So in this case I've chosen 10 in both cases. Beta here, step control, that's a parameter. The larger you make that, the more aggressive in a way the load stepping is. So the idea, the basic aim of this multiplier elastoplastic analysis is to get to failure. You don't want to get way beyond failure. You don't want to go way out here, right? But you want something reasonable. And in this case it, it's not too unreasonable actually at all. But if we wanted more of a, a defined plateau, we could uh, we could increase, we could try to increase this to, to 10, for example. We could also use more plastic steps. We can do a combination. Um, well, let's just keep that to 10 and then this step control parameter increased from 5 to 10. So then we should, we would have a more a aggressive stepping towards the ultimate, ultimate limit load. And you can see that has definitely happened. We now have a very well-defined plateau. And this limit load um, is, is then, uh, it's, it's 400 here actually, but that's because I've used a very coarse mesh. If you use the same mesh as in the limit analysis cases, yeah, well, then you would get to the 328 we computed. So uh, this takes a lot longer, of course, because we have to basically solve something equivalent to a limit analysis problem for each of the points that define this curve. So limit analysis is, is a much faster way of, of getting to the same result as a typical load displacement analysis would provide. And um, so if we want to, so this was just in the log here, you can see we are plotting the load multiplier versus a quantity called work. Um, and this quantity is basically the external work. It's difficult to, in general, pick a displacement. So we, we, we show it as work here in the, um, in the log, but if you want proper load displacement curves, you go to XY plots. You would then have the stages out here, and then there is uh, the, the X variable. Uh, is it a global or a local? and uh, the y variable as well. Um, ah, sorry, yeah, uh, it's stage two, so um, we have the four stages. I was just confused there for, for a moment. We have the two stages, LB, UB, the limit analysis stages, then the elastoplastic stage, the SLS stage, where I did the SLS in one direct calculation, and then the uh, multiply elastoplastic stage, stage two. And in stage two, we have some local variables. That's basically the result points, right? So I can pick result point one, and what do I want on the x-axis? Yes, let's say I want the displacement. Um, so this numerical value u is the is the um, it's basically uh, u x squared plus the square root of u x squared plus u y squared. So it's the total uh, displacement. Uh, and on on stage on um, on the y-axis, I would actually like the load multiplier, right? So that looks like this. That was result point one, so the one over here. And if we then wanted result point two, we would go like that and then add that. And that looks a little bit different because the, because as, as you saw, the foundation rotates. So uh, the load multiplier is the same, but the, the, the displacements at each, for each load multiplier in, at the two points is, is slightly different. So, um, so that was basically a, a brief introduction to how the analysis types um, work. I should also say if you can plot something 
something else, let's say the stresses, all the results, all the, all the uh, relevant results are, are available here, uh, including the initial stresses uh, and the material parameters as well. This is a good way of just checking, especially if you have variable material parameters, which is also a possibility, um, then it's a good to just check that you have what you think you have. Um, and whatever I mean, total and effective stresses, um, and to get access to, to the actual values, well, you press them and they come up over here. The whole result set, in this case, um, uh, yeah, the whole result set, stresses, strains, and so forth, are shown over here in the property window. With the plots as well, um, people ask that all the time. They're not happy with this, the way this, this looks. They want just the results and want to export the results to their own Excel or whatever and then replot replot their results, their load displacement curves or whatever it is. Um, so the way to get those numbers is to plot the curve, then select the curve and then go over here to data and the numbers are available here and you can uh, copy those and insert them into Excel or a text file or whatever you want. You can also save the plots for, for later use. Um, then there is a quite a quite a good tool for generating reports. Um, so this report will contain information from the four different stages, unless I, I unclick one of them. And then um, if I want, say, a plot like this in the report, I would say add to report. And then OK. And then when I, when I uh, create the report, well, this figure here has been, has been included in the report. And if I generate, oh, I need to specify a title, I can say test report. And then generate. It generates and then creates uh, a bit of a preview. And you can then save this as a basically a Word file. That you can then open up and, and of course, edit in Word. So, full editing capability for that. Um, you can export the results as well. So, the actual results that you see on the screen, in this case, the stresses, um, you, can, um, you can export them to a CSV file comma separated value file that you can open in Excel and then all the results are available here um, and that can be and they can be be of course uh, replotted all the information needed to replot these results in some other program than Optum G2 if, if that's what you really want I don't think it's really necessary in most cases but if if that's what you want then it, it can be done So, so that was a um, that was an introduction to Optum G2, and that concludes this module. And then in the next module, we'll be looking at limit analysis, uh, this type of analysis here, in a lot more detail. So, see you then. Bye.